Hi, good morning. Uh, I hope you are all well and healthy and safe. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about pelvic health, uh, how we can be managing it in our current pandemic situation, and also a couple things about how we can expand our conversation about pelvic health. So who we can be talking to, how we can talk to them. And then I'm also going to talk a little bit about pad math. So uh, to get started, um, I wanted to I wanted to share. I'm pulling up my phone here because I saved the image. So there is a, a study. Uh, actually, it was an international survey on vaginal atrophy, and this was from 2010. And I wanted to share the statistics with you because it kind of goes. It's it it goes along with how we can expand this conversation and how we can be talking about it with more people. But sixty percent of women report feeling uncomfortable or embarrassed about talking about it. So that's not super shocking. But one um, taking it a step further on that stat is women are embar they don't want to talk to their healthcare provider because they're afraid of making their healthcare providers embarrassed, not necessarily themselves, but this one says they were uncomfortable or embarrassed for themselves, but it's also, they don't want to have their healthcare professional feel embarrassed. The challenge with our healthcare system is in Canada, we have about seven to 10 minutes with our, uh, if we're seeing a doctor, uh, and that's a very limited time. And their job is to kind of rule out any major, major issues. And there isn't necessarily time to explore and ask questions about pelvic health and, and what have you. So if the person themselves is embarrassed to even bring it up, even if they're there for another reason, then it's never going to be talked about because the typically the doctors aren't necessarily doing that either just because of their limited time. Uh, another statistic was that 52% of women think that others do not want to hear about it. 52% of women felt that it was too private to talk about. And this I think is starting to change. So with the world we live in now with social media, I think that it is, it is becoming more talked about. It is becoming, uh, much more accessible. So because there are more professionals talking about it, because there are more people hearing about it, seeing about it, seeing it, reading it, what have you, they're also now seeking out people who are comfortable talking about it. And then there's a lot more professionals now who, such as myself, I don't do any internal <clears throat> treatment or assessment, but I have a great community of people who do that I refer to. So once you identify one person that sort of opens up some doors. So one person who's comfortable talking about it and who's sharing information, even if they may not be able to help with all aspects of it, there are uh, typically they have a community of people who can, because really pelvic health takes a village. And um, as Shirley promotes in Mokita, there's there are so many different people and different types of therapies, dip, different approaches, different mindsets that can help with various aspects of women's health. And the same goes for pelvic health. It's it's not just one person and we need a team. We need the medical community. We need the physiotherapy community. We need naturopathic doctors. We need, I think Chinese medicine plays a role. Nutrition plays a role. Exercise plays a role. So there's lots of different people, all typically who have subset specialties within there. So, um, so the good news about people thinking it's too private, I think that's starting to change. Um, so I actually need to look into the study to look at the ages of people. It, it was menopause, but I want to understand the full gamut of the age ranges of, of people um, to, to see if that changes. Because what I, what I think is starting to happen, which is what I want to happen, is that the information is being passed to younger and younger people. And that in turn, I think that kind of next generations of people reaching menopause and, and, you know, going beyond menopause are going to be much more informed. And, uh, and that's ultimately what we're looking for. 49% um, of women think 
that it's just part of growing older. So that's super common. A lot of people think that a lot of the challenges that they might be dealing with, not necessarily even just pelvic health are because they're getting older. So there's a lot of myths to be dispelled. And I would love to see the conversation start when we are teaching our teens about sexual health, about menstruation, when they're learning about their bodies. I think it's an opportunity where we start to introduce conversations around function. So even when they're in PE class and they're learning about muscles and bodies, when they're in physiology, when they're looking at um, you know any sort of biology even, just when they start looking at body systems and functions, identifying, even, even just identifying that there is a group of muscles in the pelvic floor and that they respond like other muscles in the body, what they're made up, why they're important, the jobs that they have. I think it would be um, amazing. So just opening up the door, starting the conversation with that younger generation, both male and female, uh, I think is just, it's just part of, of normalizing it really. And that will then translate into it just becoming part of the conversation, which is what we're, what we're hoping for. In terms of now, so my mom is, how old is my mom? She is 75. She's 75. Um, and she was very open with me. So really, I credit my mom with taking me down, getting me into this, this work, this line of work, really. She was open with, she was a, an OR nurse. Uh, she was very comfortable talking about the body. Sometimes, of course, when you're younger and you're learning about it, it's you, you you don't like it, but secretly, I always, I always welcomed the fact that I knew I could talk to my mom about anything, and I could ask her questions, and she would share things with me. So, um, so she isn't necessarily one that I needed to convince. Now, I think she's always known it. But when I look at my mom's path, she was in most likely these statistics here where. It wasn't something that was talked about. It was, uh, she suffered for a long time with incontinence and then finally had surgery. And I remember her saying, well, I wish I'd done this earlier. And when I look back on, on it now, so at the time she had her surgery, I, I didn't know what I know now. I wasn't doing what I'm doing. But when I look back on it, I wonder if she had known about pelvic floor physiotherapy, had uh, uh, she known about pelvic floor exercise, what have you, would she have still ended up having surgery? I don't know. Well, it's tough to say, but I think that the the conversations are easier now because there are more things to share. So not everybody, you can't always just pick up the phone or have lunch with your mom or girlfriend and, and it may not, depending on your upbringing, it may not be a, the easiest conversation to have. But there are, there are more ways now to share information with regards to videos, uh, maybe emails, so sending an email with a link to somebody's page or to an exercise video that you found helpful. Something to say that you, um, if, if you can identify as you having suffered with something or you having experienced something and then tried something that brought you some benefit or some change or some improvement, that's a very easy share because you're looking to help the person. So this is something that I've been through and that can open up the the dialogue with, I didn't know you were experiencing this. This is what I've been dealing with. So I think the amount of resources we have online now make it an easy share. Um, so that's something that I would, uh, I would recommend in terms of starting conversations. And I also think that the more we can start those conversations with people, I also encourage people to have those conversations with their healthcare providers as well. So when they are, even if you're not necessarily going for um, seeing your doctor for pelvic health reason, you can still bring it up. Or when you have your pap exams, if you're still having pap exams, or um, maybe you are going because of incontinence. And, and the more informed you are based on what you've learned from other people, the more you can introduce those as options with your healthcare provider as well. And you won't always necessarily have support or time with them. But one thing you can do too is we we have access to uh, to really anybody. 
And so it, when you have found someone and you're having success, tell your other healthcare professionals about them, because that's what starts to build that collaborative network, basically. Um, so talking to other people who are in your community, friends, sisters, aunts, uh, anybody really. And I also think that if you have, if you have, um, relationships with men who are in relationships with women who may be struggling with this, it's also important to talk to the men about it as well and give them tools to help them understand what their partners may be going through, how they could help. Um, so I know sometimes, you know, we may have male, female, like husband, wife, friends. Um, my husband is very well, well versed in what I do and he often talks to uh, other other males who you know have spouses have wives and that hearing it from his perspective from a man to a man also helps that other man feel um, like he's not alone or it helps bring some clarity or something he didn't know about like I remember one of my neighbors was uh, he felt that his relationship was failing he thought his wife didn't love him anymore and uh, when she actually came to, I think it was he that prompted her to, to attend, but she attended one of my Kegels and Cocktails events, ended up going to see a pelvic floor physiotherapist, and it changed their life. And it, it helped her open up to him about what she was experiencing and, and it made their relationship better. So a lot of men are unsure. They, they don't know. Women are starting to withdraw. They're suffering in silence. They don't know. They think it's normal, but they don't know who to seek help from. And then that's affecting the relationship. So I think there's a lot of conversations really that, that could be happening. And um, yeah, so it's not always easy, but I think we have a lot of amazing resources that are very easily shared through a Facebook message or Instagram or through an email message. And if you can highlight that it's something that you used or you tried or you've heard has been really helpful for many people and not necessarily say, you know, I think you need this um, to make a person feel like it's, I don't want to say attacked, but not everybody, you know, it's, not everybody is forthcoming. So if, if you know that somebody has incontinence, maybe you know it because of other signs and symptoms you're looking at, not necessarily because they've told you. And so if you send something saying, I think this is going to help you, they might feel like, well, how do you know? How do you know? Why? What makes you think I have a problem? So I think that if you say this is something that I've been experiencing and noticing these changes in my body and blah, 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 I found this, I've tried it. I think it's been helpful. I wanted to share it with other women and maybe share it with a, a few different people. So those are a couple of things. I don't know if that helps, but hopefully it does. The other thing that I wanted to talk about, and again, I'm pulling up my phone to look at a post that I had made. Um, Shirley mentioned, I was telling you how to save $50,000. So I made a post about pad math and I took a look at um, how, how much people are spending. So lots of numbers are thrown around there and, and, some have said upwards of $1,500 a year on pads. Uh, and I took, I looked at what is the absolute kind of bare minimum. So the most conservative. And I looked at, I just did a Google search for a pair of, uh, sorry, a set of pads. So this was uh, incontinence pads that I could buy online. It was a leading brand and it was for 30 light absorbency pads. And the cost was just under $30. So it was about 93 cents a pad. And so if I was doing that, uh, using that, those pads once per day, <clears throat> pardon me, it would have been about $335 a year. So that's one light absorbency pad per day. And many people I know are using a more absorbent pad and they're changing multiple times a day. So this is kind of like a bare minimum. If somebody was using a light absorbency, one pad a day, with this particular brand. And then you multiply that and you get up, you know, it, it's, if you're using pads now, think of how many more years you're going to live. And obviously we don't know what that is, but let's, you know, we, if uh, keeping care and, and what have you, we could live another 20, 30, 40, 50 years. 
So when you start adding that up, even at just that conservative message, uh, conservative um, number, sorry, 15 years was $5,000 and so on. So um, 55 years, it was going to be $18,000. And again, that's the conservative side. So mm. knowing that there are other people who are spending closer to $1,000 per month, that number goes up exponentially and can get upwards of $50,000. That's a lot of money. And it's, it's a lot of money that we could use for other things. It's a lot of disposable waste in our environment. So we have a huge opportunity there to address that and have people understand the cost and also that it's not just, so when you're wearing a pad, it is addressing a symptom. They have a place and ideally it's only temporary. It's a temporary need while, while you're seeking help. But many people, and again, because of those statistics we were looking at too, many people think it's just part of getting older. So they just accept it. A lot of advertisements tell us that it's just part of being a woman. So we just need to accept it. And if people understood the number of professionals we have available to us to help, even if we go see, so the, the cost of a pelvic floor physiotherapist is between 75 and $130 roughly. So usually for your first session, it's about an hour long and it's usually around 130 to 150 sometimes. And after that, subsequent appointments, depending on you, but subsequent appointments may be half an hour. So more closer to maybe 75 or $80 for the half an hour. And I say go at least once a year. So say you go once or even say three or six sessions, that's still only $450 to $780 a year. So about the same, a little bit more than if you were wearing a pad every single day. But when you look at the cost over time, you are saving the environment and you are not allowing yourself to get up into more, more pads that you have to change and higher absorbency and getting closer to that thousand to $1,500 a month zone. And also look at the cost to relationships, the cost to fitness and movement. A lot of people, when they're dealing with incontinence or leaking or what have you, they also stop moving in certain ways. And sometimes they stop moving altogether because they don't want to make it worse or because they are afraid that people are going to smell or they're going to see their pad or what have you. So they start to become more isolated. They're not moving as much. And the cost of not moving is huge. There are so many other health, <clears throat> health challenges that can come as a result of not moving. So when we can address this holistically and look at the financial costs, but also all of the other costs to our health and to our confidence, we're not just leaking urine, we're leaking power, we're leaking opportunity, we're leaking confidence. We're, we're a lot is happening because we're not addressing our incontinence. So um, we, we need to address that. So the, the best ways in terms of what I recommend Pelvic floor physio is always hands down my number one thing if you have access to one. Of course, right now we live in a time where uh, we are living in a time where uh, we don't have access. We can't go see our pelvic floor physiotherapists. A lot of them are doing telehealth, but I do believe there's a lot of value with an internal assessment. Because we don't have access to that now, we can do our own internal assessments. So we can use our own fingers. We can use our own fingers and when we are doing a kegel exercise can we feel a gentle kind of like a hug of the of the finger and then a gentle drawing up and in we can use a partner's fingers we could use a partner's penis uh, there's biofeedback devices that you can buy online the one that i like um, probably the most is called the lv e l v i e and it can help distinguish between somebody who's who is doing a proper kegel versus somebody who's actually bearing down and thinking they're doing a Kegel. So that is a device that can help with that. So learning how to do a Kegel correctly is imperative. And uh, another opportunity that, um, that you have right now, I have a, an online program called Kegel Mojo. And right now I have a seven day free trial until the end of April. So anytime between now and the end of April, whenever you join, you have seven full days to go through the program for free. 
And I go through all sorts of what happens in a pelvic floor physiotherapist assessment. Um, what, what is pelvic floor physio? How to do kegels? How to take them into movement? So my philosophy with regards to kegels is not just three sets of 10, 10 second holds done three times a day, which is kind of the gold standard uh, prescription. My philosophy is first you need to do them correctly, then you need to be doing them consistently, and then you need to also be doing them coordinated with movement. So doing three sets of 10, 10 second holds three times a day is better than nothing for sure. And there is studies to show that that helps. But I believe that we need to incorporate our pelvic floor into movement and into dynamic positions that help mimic real life and ideally even bring them into real life. So using what's called the knack, which is a, a pre-voluntary contraction before you cough or sneeze or pick something up, something to help kind of make sure that that pelvic floor is engaged and supporting you. Um, so I invite you to take advantage of that. Um, use your partner or your own fingers to self-assess and then make sure that you're doing them consistently. So this is always the biggest piece. Well, I forget to do them or I, you know, I just don't remember or I don't have the time. Doing it, once you understand how to do kegels and how to do them as part of movement, if you're, if you have some sort of a workout routine, you can incorporate them into your workout routine or really it takes five to 10 minutes a day. So in my buff muff challenge, the, the amount of time that you spend is initially it's about five minutes. And then the most is around 10, 10 minutes per day. So it's very accessible time-wise. I just had somebody comment today that she said she loves the exercises and love how it's not a huge time commitment. So part of that getting into that consistent habit piece is doing them every day, making it part of your routine, whether it's where you work out or having a structured pelvic floor exercise time and recognizing that it's really only five to 10 minutes. It's not a lot of time um, out of your day. So, uh, so paying attention really is um, important. And I even, actually, I'm just staring at my day timer I use a planner from one of my business coaches and, you know, I, I write everything out. And I remember talking to her about, you know, if we, if people are recording things or making notes about things in their day timers or in their calendars, can we do it? She, she was creating a bunch of little sticker packs to help people. And I said, can we do a Kegel sticker? So we did a Kegel sticker. Where is it? There it is right there. See? So whatever helps sticky notes, stickers, making a note in your phone, the Buff Muff Challenge, it's an app on your phone, it sends you daily reminders, um, whatever, whatever helps you continue that awareness, because really, at the end of the day, it is something we need to pay attention to every day. And if we're paying attention, because we are leaking, then that is, we are being, att we are being attentive, we are sensing symptoms that are distracting us from work, distracting us from our relationships, distracting us from fitness. They're getting in the way. So let's address that and get it out, get it off of our plate. We don't need another distraction. So let's address the symptoms, pay attention to the symptoms. They're there for a reason. They're asking, the body is asking for something to change. It's asking us for some help. So let's listen and let's do the work and it becomes then part of your part of your life part of your day and over time it, in the buff muff challenge people around two weeks are noticing significant change many people are you know leaking less or not leaking at all i get lots of comments like i sneezed today and i didn't leak woohoo and it doesn't take much it doesn't take much time and it doesn't take much time in terms of like time per day but also time uh to, to notice a change, but please, please note that it is something that needs to be done consistently. It's not something that we do and we now, oh, we don't leak anymore. And now we stop. It needs to be a consistent lifestyle that we lead a Kegel centric lifestyle. Um, so pelvic floor physiotherapist, take advantage of the free trial uh, and get as much information out of that as you possibly can. Um, check out the buff muff challenge. You might want to join the next one. It starts May 5th. And, uh, and the information that Shirley is sharing too, with regards to vaginal dryness, um, genitourinary syndrome of menopause, all of that is, is, 
is huge. There's so much valuable information being shared on this page, also by other health practitioners. So visit here often and um, yeah, and, and seek out help. So I don't see anybody here who has any, I can never see questions on this new platform here. Uh, oh, hang on one second. Questions, there's no questions here. So if, if there's anybody watching who has any questions, feel free to post them. Um, Otherwise, you can find me at vaginacoach.com and my email is kim at vaginacoach, but I invite you to post a question in the menopause groups, um, sorry, menopause community page here and tag me in it. So, because chances are somebody else has that same question and it would be great to address it where other people can see the response as well. So that's probably the best way to reach me. But, um, but I, I know Shirley had, had posed a challenge for everybody this year to see a pelvic floor physiotherapist. And she also challenged everybody to join the last Buff Muff challenge. Um, I challenge you today to maybe go on YouTube and find a Kegel video um, or maybe find an exercise, um, maybe share the free trial that I have with somebody. Um, I'm going to write in here, I'll just write in the comment where it is, but I challenge you to, hang on, I can't do two things at the same time. Uh, there you go. So you can check that out. Um, I challenge you to think of somebody, whether it's a mom, sister, aunt, cousin, friend, anybody in your community and ask them to join you in the challenge. Ask, send them a link to the free trial. Tell them that you have heard about pelvic floor physiotherapists. Ask them if they have ever been to one. Find a pelvic floor physiotherapist who you can um, book in with once our pandemic is over. And a lot of them are doing initial consults and what have you via telehealth right now. And Honestly, most pelvic health physios have a, a huge wait list. And I think many of them now due to pelvic health or um, the pandemic and telehealth, not they, they don't have as much um, as much of a, of a lead time, a wait time. So book a telehealth appointment right now, get in to see somebody, you will have done the initial kind of assess assessment, um, well, verbal assessment and screening at least with them. So take advantage of that. But Basically, my challenge is to think about who you can share the message of pelvic health with, because we are all in this together and we all rely, there's always information being shared. And if there's something that you think can benefit someone, know that you would like somebody to have shared that with you. So please go and share that with them as well. So we can open up, as, as Shirley says, crack open the conversation and start inspiring others and start making a difference in the world so that the people who are currently suffering can find relief. And the people who are in the younger generations, maybe we're preventing suffering for them. Maybe we're opening up opportunities for them to, um, to have a different path. So, um, so that's it for now. And I hope you stay well and happy and healthy and, um, and do your kegels. We'll see you next time.